The Apostle Paul said to preach the truth in love. And I think a lot of times people look at that passage where the Apostle Paul said to preach the truth in love or to speak the truth in love. And they, they think that that is talking about a manner of speaking. That is to be, to be soft-spoken, to be kind of, you know, uh, folding your hands and kind of looking down and shuffling your feet a little bit. And kind, of, kind of almost being apologetic about what you're saying. Kind of uh, saying it in such a way that, that you're, you're almost afraid to, to say what you're saying. That's not what speaking the truth in love means. Speaking the truth in love is not talking about the manner of speaking. It's talking about the motive for what we say. The reason we say the things that we say, the reason we talk about the distinctiveness of the church, the, the distinctiveness of the body of Christ, the, 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 the simple plan of salvation, the simple pattern of New Testament worship, and the, the uh, 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 obligation we have to Christ who gave Himself for us to live for Him. The reason that we're, we're willing to say those things is out of love. And so if, if you hear something in these lessons that, that maybe what we say down in Georgia rubs you the wrong way, we want you to know that, that uh, that's not our intention. And, and I know uh, it was said last night that the, the elders here uh, are ready and, and willing and, and uh, very well able to, to study any questions you might have. Uh, the the uh, good preacher here is, is uh, uh, very ready and willing and able to study any questions that you might have. So uh, we, we pray that these lessons will provoke thought, will, will provoke what Isaiah said, to come and let us reason together. That's our intention, because we do care. Because we want to all make it to heaven together. That's our goal. And so the question this evening, you can see on the screen, is a difficult question. It's a question uh, that, it, it is a common question. I've been asked it many times uh, in studying with people. I, I've had it kind of thrown at me at times as an accusation uh, in, in uh, different forms. And it is a very important question. And, and we need to understand that, that the things we're talking about this week, we, the things that we've been talking about six, since Sunday, we'll, we'll conclude talking about uh, tomorrow evening. These things are not uh, my opinion or your opinion or, or somebody else's opinion. We're not discussing our opinions and, and we're not talking about things that are of, of light and insignificant uh, 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 consequences. We're talking about life and death matters. We're actually even more important than life and death matters because it's spiritual life and death matters. You know, we understand that, that, that we all will face death in this life. But what's even more important than that understanding of uh, our appointment with death is the understanding of what comes after that and being prepared for that day. Being prepared for what comes after our death. And so we're talking about things that pertain to spiritual life and death matters. And so we certainly want these things to be taken uh, uh, very seriously and, and very uh, 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 intuitively. So that we will, we will study these things and we will talk about these things and we will discuss these things with each other. And we'll, we'll come to a unified understanding on these things. So that, again, <clears throat> as our goal is, we can all go to heaven together. So as we ask this question, can a person be saved in a denomination? It is a question that prompts further questioning. Now, can a person be saved in a denomination? Well, the first question that I ask in response to that basic question is how many of them did Jesus promise? Because we read uh, in, in the Old Testament prophets, we read in the preaching of John, we read in the preaching of Jesus, we read in the preaching of, of the uh, uh, disciples, promises of the coming church. Promises of the kingdom coming. And so in those promises, 
How many denominations would be included in those promises? How many denominations did Jesus promise would come? Another question that arises from being asked this question, can a person be saved in a denomination, is the question, how many of them did Jesus establish? You know, uh, when people ask about denominations, the, the most fundamental question that, that can be asked in response to that is how many of them did Jesus establish? Where can you find in Scripture where Jesus established that particular church, that particular religious organization? Where can you find where that particular religious organization was something that Jesus put into uh, its existence? Where did He establish it? Another question that comes up is how many of them did Jesus say He was coming back for? Three very important questions. You, you see, one of them relates to the, to the promises of Scripture. Another one relates to being established on the authority of Scripture. And the third one relates to the promise of the future uh, uh, reception of Christ. Him coming back to receive His people and to take them to heaven, presenting them to the Father. And so when we can answer these three questions, <clears throat> we can answer that first question, can't we? If we can answer these three questions, how many of them did Jesus promise? How many of them did Jesus establish? How many of them did Jesus say He was coming back for? When we see the answer to those three questions, we can answer the first question, can a person be saved in a denomination? Well, first of all, did Jesus promise denominations? Is there the promise in Scripture from Christ or anywhere else? Is there the promise in Scripture for what we see in the religious world today that is the denominational system? Of course, a, a system that at its fundamental core, at its, at its most fundamental nature, is based on division. That's what denomination means, to divide up. You have your different denominations of money that are different kinds of, of uh, bills. And so at its most fundamental nature, denominations are based in the principle of div divided up based on kinds, different kinds. Well, did Jesus promise such a system? Let's notice, first of all, in Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, beginning, that Isaiah records this promise of the coming house of the Lord. And it says, It shall come to pass in the last days, an important phrase in this promise. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow unto it. And so, you have the promise there of the mountain Mountain used in Scripture, especially Old Testament prophecy. Mountain referring to uh, governmental systems or kingdoms. And talking about the kingdom of the Lord, the Lord's house being established on the top of the mountains. You see over in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15 what that's talking about. The mountain of the Lord's house. Am I doing that? Is that me? told you it was too loud. <laughs> in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15, it says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Now, is there a promise? Can anyone look at those two passages parallel, laid side by side? and see a promise of what we see in the religious world today as the denominational system. You have the mountain of the Lord's house, a, a kingdom, a governmental system 
The mountain of the Lord's house. Well, when we find the fulfillment of that promise, when we find how that promise is referred to in the New Testament, we find the Lord's house, the house of God, being referred to as the church. Well, how many churches were there then? There weren't denominations. There were no denominations then. And so you don't see any promise there of a denominational system. What about Daniel chapter 2, beginning with verse 44, where we read, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Now, I don't typically turn my back to the audience Sometimes I'm a little afraid to turn my back to the audience. But how many is that? A kingdom. The kingdom. Does, does that include, is it possible for that to include what we see in the religious world as the denominational system? Absolutely not. What about Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, where, where Jesus promises His church. And He says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build My church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now, next time you have somebody... Uh, make an indication that the kingdom and the church are two different things, ask them this simple question. Did Jesus say to Peter that he was going to build one thing and give him the keys to something else? Because if the church and the kingdom are not the same thing, then that's what Jesus did there. He told Peter and the apostles, I'm going to build my church, but that's not for y'all to worry about. I'm going to give you the keys to something else. And according to the uh, premillennialist system that the kingdom hasn't come yet, that we're still looking for some future fulfillment of, of the coming kingdom, that the church was kind of a plan B, kind of a, 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 a stopgap between when Christ could, could uh, uh, come back and be received by the Jews and, and bring His kingdom into existence. And when He first came, according to this, what Christ gave Peter the keys for didn't even come in Peter's lifetime. It just doesn't make any sense. The church and the kingdom are the same thing. Jesus told the apostles there, I will build my church. I'm going to establish my kingdom. As Isaiah said, my kingdom is going to come in the last days. It's going to be established on the top of the mountains in Jerusalem. That's the top of the mountains. He says, I will build my church and I'm going to give you the keys to open the way into that church. I'm going to give you the keys to open the way into the kingdom that I'm going to establish. So when you look at that, I will build my church. That's singular. It's not plural. Uh, at, at best, you would have to have a plural word there, churches, to, to have that be a promise of the modern day denominational system that we see. It's simply not there. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Well, how many kingdoms would Christ have? How many kingdoms would Christ be the king over? Well, the church and the kingdom are the same thing. And so it's one church, one kingdom that Christ would be the head over. And you see it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. Where you see the, the, the word church there used for the first time, used in the, in the uh, 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 present, used as being in existence. Every time before this, references to the church, references to the kingdom, are, is, is future tense. Looking forward to a future fulfillment. However, here in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47, it's not looking for something in the future. It's talking about something that is in existence. Acts chapter 2, 
The church came into existence when Peter and the apostles preached the gospel there in answer to that question in verse 37. Men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter told them, repent, let every one of you be baptized for the remission of your sins. And so you had the church established there with the preaching of the gospel. The way opened to the church. The, the, the gates of the kingdom opened by the preaching of the gospel. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. And I've asked a lot of people this. I, I've gone to Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. If, if uh, 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 this evening you are a member of, of, of a denominational church, you are a member of a, a denominational system, you're part of that, then I, I'm asking you this evening, how many churches... Did Christ add people to in Acts chapter 2 and verse 47? When He promised to build His church. And in Acts chapter 2, you see that church built and in existence. And people are being added to the church daily. How many churches did He add people to? I've never had anybody tell me. And if there's anybody here this evening that, that maybe could explain to me how you could have more than one at this time, I'd love to hear it. I've never had anybody, no uh, uh, defender of denominational, uh, denom the denominational system, no defender of denominationalism has ever said to me that there was more than one church right there. That yes, I understand there was one church there, but later more developed. Well, later's too late. This was the church that Christ promised. This was the church that was the church of, of uh, prophetic promise in Isaiah 2 and Daniel 2 and Joel 2 and so many passages in the Old Testament. And so if there was only one here, when a person is baptized into Christ today, how many churches does he add people to today? How many did he promise? Just one. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13, it says, Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us, that's the same thing as added to, translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. Man, keep moving that down and keep on popping it. So the church and the kingdom are the same thing. The church and the kingdom are the same thing. Because the Lord added to the church daily those that were being saved. They, they were translated, they were moved out of the world into the kingdom of Christ. So if Acts chapter 2 and verse 47 says they were added to the church, and Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13 says that they were translated or moved into the kingdom, Obviously, the church and the kingdom are one and the same thing. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 16, it says, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. And about this time, someone will jump up and say, Aha! There you go! There's more than one church there. Well, again, denominations refer to different kinds. Different kinds of churches. That is, if, if uh, uh, you uh, have a, a particular belief system and you want to go to a church that agrees with your particular belief system and, and, and you follow that, that modern day creed of attend the church of your choice, well then that's what you're doing. You've already got your mind made up about what you believe. And so you find a church that agrees with what you already believe, and that's the church of your choice. It doesn't say anything about God's choice. I like to, I like to ask that in response to the attend the church of your choice. Well, what about God's choice? If I was going to attend the church that God chose, which one would it be? Well, it'd be the one in Acts chapter 2 that we just read about. It'd be the one in Colossians 1.13 that we just read about. It'd be those of Romans 16.16 16 that are referred to as the churches of Christ. See, that's talking about individual congregations. It's like 
the Church of Christ at Stewart's Creek, the Church of Christ at Jerseyville, where I am, the Church of Christ. Now, I can talk about where I am. I can't talk about here, but where I am, there's the Church of Christ at Jerseyville. There's Church of Christ at Godfrey. There's Church of Christ at uh, uh, Green Mount Road. Well, that would be the same thing here. That would be like saying the churches of Illinois salute you. See, they're not different kinds. They're not supposed to be anyway. They're not different kinds. They're local congregations in different geographical areas. And so it's the church of Christ. And when you have multiple congregations, it's the churches of Christ in that area, not different kinds of churches, all one church, just in different areas. So, certainly no denominations there. Did Jesus promise denominations? Well, back in Matthew chapter 16, verses 18 and 19, it says, and I say unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And after the passages we've just looked at, demonstrating beyond any shadow of a doubt the church and the kingdom being one and the same, there's no way that a person could look at that and say that there's more than one church there. There's The church is the kingdom. Christ is the, the king of His kingdom. One. There's no promise of denominationalism there. There's no promise of denominations found in Scripture. The, the very idea of denominationalism, the attend the church of your choice, Attend the church that, that makes you the most comfortable in what you believe, in what you've already made up your mind that, that, that you want to hold to. Go find the church that best suits that and, and be a part of that church. That very mentality, that very idea contradicts what Jesus Himself prayed for. In John cha uh, chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus Himself prayed against denominationalism. Jesus prayed that denominationalism would not exist, would not succeed, would not be the appeal that people would turn to. It contradicts the very thing that Jesus prayed for. So certainly He could not have promised it. It says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which believe on Me through their word. You know... <clears throat> I don't think there's ever been a time, including right now, that I read that passage that it doesn't have a profound effect on me. Because that passage says that Christ was praying for me. When I am the kind of person that believes on Him according to the Apostles' doctrine, according to what the Apostles wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, as they were guided into all truth, and they wrote it down, as I believe on Christ according to that Word, I'm that person He was praying for there. If you're that person, you're the person He was praying for there. Now to me, to, to read a passage that says that the Son of God Himself said a prayer for me. That's powerful. That's very meaningful. And it, it should be very meaningful to us when we read that. And He goes on in verse 21, and He says what it is that He's praying for. That they all may be one, as Thou, Father, art in me, and I in Thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. So, it's unity that is one of the marks of the church that, that draws people to Christ. It's one of the things that, that people look at and they say, I want to be a part of that. That kind of unity, that kind of cohesiveness, that kind of family. I want to be a part of that. But he says that they all may be one. That they all may be one. I'm asked frequently, why are there so many churches? Why is it when you drive down the street in any town of significant size at all, why is it 
that you can see so many different kinds of churches, so many different uh, uh, what, what we might refer to as stripes of Christians. Why is it that you see all these different uh, 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 churches? And my simple answer to that is that they do not believe on him by their word. If they all, if all of those, if all the people in all of those buildings, if all of the people that belong to all of those, now I don't refer to, to uh, uh, them as Christians, I refer to them as denominationalists. Because the Bible is very clear about who and what a Christian is. But if they all in all of those buildings believed on Him through their word, then there wouldn't be any differences, would there? They would all be the same church. You could go into any one of them at any given time. You could go and you could hear the teaching, the preaching. You could go and talk to the people in those places and they would all be saying the same thing. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10 says, all speaking the same things of the same mind. Using the same judgment. Now how is it that we can all speak the same thing and use the same judgment? Well, that's that we have the same source of information that we're speaking from. That we all believe on Him through their Word. That's how we can all be one. That's the only way we can all be one. That's the standard for unity. And a lot of times people have the idea that, well, if, if we just do away with this doctrine you know, that people have trouble with, you know, there's a lot of people that have trouble with this particular doctrine or that particular doctrine, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, or the, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, or, you know, any, you go down the list, any number of doctrines. Well, you know, there's a lot of people that have trouble with those doctrines. So let's, you know, let's de-emphasize those things. Let's not talk about those things as much. Let's kind of sweep those things under the rug. Well, how many, how many things does it take under the rug before a congregation has lost its candlestick, is no longer the Lord's church, and is essentially another denomination? How many does it take? I think that's a valid question, don't you? How many does it take? The only way we can all be one is that we believe on Him by their Word. That's the standard for unity. We don't create unity when we try to discount some of the, some of the doctrines that people consider to be difficult or, or, or some of the doctrines that people have trouble with and we discount those and we sweep those under the rug for the sake of unity. No, that doesn't create unity. It creates denominations. That's, that's where denominations came from. That's the origin of denominationalism is, is uh, the development of doctrines and saying, well, we believe it ought to be this way. And another group saying, well, we believe it ought to be this way. Well, you go that way, we'll go this way. People that agree with you can go over there and people that agree with us can come over here. That's not what Jesus prayed for. And the only way to have the unity that Jesus prayed for is to have that single standard, that single source of information. That is the word that he sent the Holy Spirit to guide the apostles in the writing of. His doctrine. The doctrine of Christ. So did Jesus promise denominations? No. Did Jesus establish denominations? Well, you know, when we look through the promises, we can see in the promises, okay, He, he said He would build His church, His church is His kingdom, okay. But when it came time for the establishment, maybe Jesus decided that He would establish a variety of, of churches, that, that He would give people kind of the Baskin Robbins, uh, where they could have the, the 31 flavors and they could choose what they wanted. They could attend the church of their choice rather than His choice. Maybe He did that when it came time to establish the church. Well, let's see. Did Jesus establish denominations? Again, Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. And when He says, and it shall come to pass in the last days. That's a, a very significant term. When uh, uh, it says in the last days, you, you find that again in Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, it's referring to Joel 2. And, and what Joel referred to. And it says... In Acts chapter 2, beginning verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days. 
So when an inspired apostle of Christ says this in Acts chapter 2 is what Joel was talking about, well then there's no more questions about what Joel was talking about, is there? Peter says what Joel was talking about. We have an inspired interpretation of what Joel was prophesying. And he was prophesying the establishment of the church. What would happen when the church was established? How the Holy Spirit would be poured out at the establishment of the church. How spiritual gifts would be imparted. And the church would spread through, through the, the work of those spiritual gifts in the first century. And it says there, but this is that. That is what you're seeing now today here on Pentecost in Jerusalem in A.D. 30, the first Pentecost after the ascension of Christ back to heaven. What you're seeing here today is what Joel talked about when he said, and it shall come to pass in the last days. The last days started right there in Acts chapter 2. We, are we living in the last days? Yes. Not like the premillennialists like to say every time they watch the news and a new war breaks out somewhere and they say, oh, see there, it's a sign of the times. We're living in the last days. No, we've been living in the last days since Acts chapter 2. We've been living in the last days since Pentecost of A.D. 30. And the reason it's the last days is because there won't be any more days of human history after this one. These are the last days of human history. See, they couldn't call them the last days under patriarchy because there was going to be another age of human history referred to as the Mosaic Dispensation. Well, they couldn't call the Mosaic Dispensation in the last days because there would be another dispensation of human history, the Christian Dispensation. But it's the Christian dispensation that, ref that, that began in, in uh, Acts chapter 2 that is referred to as the last days. Why? Because there won't be any other dispensations of human history. There won't be any other days of human history. When the Christian age is over, human history is over. And the world will come to an end, 2 Peter chapter 3 says. It will be burned up with fervent heat and the elements themselves will melt. And so, clearly, Acts chapter 2 is the day that the church was established. I don't know of, of uh, very many at all whether or not they believe what the Bible says or not that will look at the, all of the connections to Acts chapter 2 and then turn around and say, well, no, the church wasn't established then. Most people who have even a fundamental understanding of the Bible understand that the church that was promised was established in Acts chapter 2. So when we see Jesus saying in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, I will build my church, and then we read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, and hath put all things under his feet, that is Christ, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. It says there, the church is his body. Well, how many bodies does he have? How many churches did he establish? Did he, did he establish any denominations? Well, that would just be a freak of nature, wouldn't it? A, a single head with multiple bodies? That doesn't happen. And so clearly he did not establish denominations. Back in Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, he says, I will build my church. Well, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, that church that is referred to as his body, in, in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, there is one body. Now, that gets it down pretty simple, doesn't it? There's one body. What's the body? The body's the church. What church? The church that Jesus said, I will build. How many did He build? One. He promised one. He built one. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, it says, For as the body is one, 
and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been uh, made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And again, somebody will read that and they'll say, they'll say, Aha! I found denominations in the Bible. There's many members. And those members are all the different denominations out there. See, you, you, Christ has one body. That's right. Yeah, the Bible says one body. And Christ has one body. But that one body is made up of all these different denominations. All these different denominations are the members of that one body. Well... There's a little problem with that. Because this wasn't written to a, a, a group of denominations. This was written to a congregation with lots of people sitting in the assembly of that congregation. One congregation. The Corinthian Church of Christ. The, or the Church of Christ at Corinth, we might say. It was written to that congregation. And to that congregation, as the Apostle Paul is addressing their, their problem of abusing the spiritual gifts in chapters 12, 13, and 14, he is instructing them about their unity and about how those spiritual gifts are for the purpose of their, their unity and for the work of their, their unified work in Christ. Not to be used to, to glorify themselves or to, to aggrandize themselves. And in Acts chapter 12, if you want a simple outline of 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14, chapter 12 is spiritual gifts enumerated. Chapter 13 is spiritual gifts durated. They're going to end when the, word, when the Word is complete. He says in uh, chapter 13, verse 10. So chapter 12, spiritual gifts enumerated. Chapter 13, spiritual gifts durated. Chapter 14, spiritual gifts regulated. He tells them how to use the spiritual gifts and how not to abuse them in chapter 14. And so in the context of his instructing a congregation, Corinth, in their use of the spiritual gifts, he refers to those people as many members in one body. That is, each congregation is made up of of. Uh, individual members, and each one of those individual members have their work that they do, have their talents that they provide that congregation for the work of the church, Ephesians chapter 4 says. And so, the many members there aren't different religious organizations. The many members there are me and you, the people, the individuals in each individual congregation. That's why it's the Church of Christ at Stewart's Creek. That's why it's the Church of Christ at Jerseyville. Not a Church of Christ. It's the Church of Christ. It's not just one amongst many. It's the body of Christ in that place. It's the Church of Christ. And the members of that body, the members of that individual congregation, being the members of that body. And so, there's no establishment of denominations there. There's further teaching on the conduct of the one body of Christ, the church of Christ. Well, is Jesus coming back for denominations? We see in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, Then come at the end, when He shall have delivered up the kingdom, to God. So when Christ comes back, what is He coming back to do? He's coming back to receive His kingdom, the kingdom, the church, the body, one body. He's coming back to receive His kingdom and to present it to the Father in heaven. When He shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. When He shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. So that's talking about the end of the last days. That's talking about when human history comes to its close and those who are in the kingdom of Christ are taken to heaven. 
And it's the kingdom. Singular. One kingdom. One church. One body. With Christ as its head. It's king. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 24, you see that one kingdom that's being delivered up to God. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13 again, you see that kingdom that He adds people to. We already uh, did the parallel between Acts chapter 2 and verse 47. The Lord added to the, the church daily those who were being saved. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, says basically the same thing, translated us into the kingdom of His dear Son. So the kingdom is the church. That's the kingdom. That's the church that's being delivered up to the Father in the last day. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 5, beginning, it says, Which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God, for which ye also suffer, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with His mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God, and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power, when He shall come to be glorified in His saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So when He comes back, He's coming back to receive His kingdom to present to the Father. And who are those that will be left out? Who are, who are those that, that are going to receive vengeance rather than rest as we talked about Sunday? Well, He says, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So if we, if we see there the necessity of obedience to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we see there the necessity of doing what they did in Acts chapter 2 when they, when they asked Peter, uh, what, what must we do or what shall we do? And he told them what they had to do. And it's the same thing we see in, in, in the, every example of conversion in the, in the book of Acts. They had to hear the Word of God. They had heard Peter preaching. They heard the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And having heard the Word of God, they believed what it taught about Christ and His kingdom. Obviously they believed because it cut them to the heart. And they wanted to know what they had to do in response to what they heard. They believed it. They heard the Word of God. They believed what it taught. Believing that, they repented of their sins. Peter told them to repent in verse 38. We know that they repented because in verse 41, they had gladly received the Word. He told them to repent. And having repented of their sins, they had to confess that they believed Jesus Christ is the Son of God. In uh, Acts chapter 8, Verse 35, when it says that uh, the eunuch asked Philip about who Isaiah and Isaiah 53 was talking about, and Philip began to, to explain to him what Isaiah was writing about in Isaiah chapter 53, it says he preached Jesus to him. Next time you hear somebody say, preach the man, not the plan. Say, okay, like Philip did. In Acts chapter 8, verse 35, when it says he preached Jesus to the eunuch. And in the very next verse, the eunuch sees water and says, see here is water, what does hinder me to be baptized? Well, where did Philip preach the plan to him? Where did it, does it say that Philip preached to him that he needed to be baptized? It just says Philip preached Jesus to him. Philip preached to him from Isaiah chapter 53 and told him that the prophet was right, not writing about himself. He was writing about Jesus who came from heaven to live the life of a human man without sin so that he could die the perfect sacrifice for our sins. The lamb slain without spot, without blemish so that he could be our propitiation. The sacrifice for our sins. And having done that, 
When we are baptized into Him, we come into contact with His saving blood and we're restored to fellowship with God. And so the eunuch... Now, I'm paraphrasing what Philip preached. (laughs) And so when the eunuch looked over and he saw the water, he said in the Greek, it's more along the lines of, look, some water! It's It's an emphatic statement. He says, see, here is water. What does hinder me to be baptized? See, Philip preached Jesus to him. You can't preach the man without preaching the plan. And Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Well, the only way that Philip could know that the eunuch believed was for the eunuch to tell him. And so the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And Philip took him down into the water and baptized him. See, that's how we obey the gospel. And that in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 8 says that if we obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have nothing to look forward to but vengeance. And so what does that have to do with Jesus coming back for denominations? Well, it says there, What will happen if someone does not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ? And when someone obeys the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they're not added to a denomination. It doesn't say anywhere that He added to this particular denomination or that particular denomination or that one over there. These people said that they would be more more comfortable in this church over here across town, so I'll add them to that one. It doesn't say that anywhere. It says that He added them to His church. When they obeyed the gospel. When in Acts chapter 2 and verse 41, those that gladly received the word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them, where did he put them? He put them in his church. So if a person has not obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, they've not been added to the church of Christ. And you know, sometimes I hear people talking about joining the church. And I I have to say, any church that you can join is not the Lord's church. See, you can't join the Lord's church. You have to be added to the Lord's church. Christ Himself has to add you to His church when you obey the gospel. And that's the church He's coming back for. Is Jesus coming back for denominations? I think the answer is clear. So let's look at the questions again. Can a person be saved in a denomination? Well, how many of them did Jesus promise? Not a one. How many of them did Jesus establish? Not one. How many of them did Jesus say He was coming back for? Never said He would. He never said He would come back for a denomination. He never never established a denomination. He never promised a denomination. So can a person be saved in a denomination? Well, all of the Scripture we've looked at tonight, all of the answers we put together tonight, the single emphatic answer that we must come to is no. There is no salvation in denominationalism. It is not possible for a person to be saved in a denomination. Now, people will ask me sometimes, do you believe that there are Christians in denominations? And I understand, and it is heartbreaking, that someone who has obeyed the gospel of Christ, who has been added by Christ to His church, that at times, they will depart. They will... will, uh, 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 marry outside the church. They will have their associations outside the church. They will make their affections in the world. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, be not deceived. Evil company corrupts good morals. It will happen. And if we try to convince ourselves that it won't happen, we're deceiving ourselves. And so sometimes... Those who have obeyed the gospel, who have been baptized into Christ, will depart. And they will go and they will join a denomination. So are there Christians in denominations? Sadly, yes. But that has to be qualified, doesn't it? 
There's no such thing as a faithful Christian in a denomination. Not one. It's not possible for a person to, to engage in a religious system that Jesus Himself prayed against when He prayed for unity according to what the apostles wrote. It's not possible for someone to do the exact opposite of what He prayed for and to be faithful to Christ. It's not possible. It may be this evening that you are currently in a denomination. And I don't think anyone here expects a person who, who is hearing this information for the first time to come running up here and say, oh, I want to be baptized. That's, I don't, I don't believe, I, that's not my expectation anyway. But if you want to study further, if you want to know more about what we're talking about, then we pray that you would let that be known and that you would study these things with all diligence. It may be that there are those here this evening that have been studying, that have been engaged in, 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 in the, the sincere study of Scripture, and that have come to, to that, that time in their study when, when they are resolved, when they are prepared, they are ready to make that confession that I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God and to be baptized into Christ. And if that's where you are this evening, then we pray that you'll make the decision to do that this very evening. Don't let another minute pass still in your sins. It may be this evening that there are those who have departed from Christ, having obeyed the gospel, having been baptized into Christ, have departed and need to come back, need to be restored. If that's where you are this evening, then we pray that you would not let another minute pass still in your sins. If you need to respond to the gospel's call, we pray that you'll come. I'll be standing soon.